Okay, so I'm going to talk about a career. This the, the title of this talk is a career in chemistry and beyond or a career in science and beyond. Um, I'm going to talk about my own particular career path, what's happened to me, what I've done. It's not necessarily at all a career path I would recommend um, uh, for everyone, not least blowing up the laboratory. Um, but everything that I have done does represent the possibility of a full time career. Uh, in around uh, after science and that's that's the theme of my talk okay um, <clears throat> so i'm going to talk about actually what i've done the different kind of jobs i've done from school and there's there's me as a as a as a schoolboy with my two brothers and that's a, a moderately recent picture of me um, i'm going to talk about my education at edinburgh university cambridge mm -hmm. university london business school my work at a large multinational oil company mm -hmm. boo hiss and as a consultant. And at the bottom of a number of the pages, um, you'll see me talking about uh, some of the key skills required. So the jobs didn't just require technical and scientific skills, they required some other interpersonal skills as well. And I'm gonna mention those in passing. I'll finish off with some ideas, things that you can do to develop your career during lockdown. Um, and I'm happy to take questions uh, if we're going through the talk, um, put your questions on the chat and those will be relayed to me. Uh, otherwise, I will try and leave a bit of time at the end and we're having a, a round table session later on as well. <clears throat> so, the story begins down in Exeter, where I went to school at this place here, which is a school in Exeter, funnily enough, called Exeter School. That isn't quite the chemistry lab that I worked in, but it was that kind of age. And here are all the school teachers. And you can see uh, in those years, all the school teachers wearing very, very smart suits apart from one. And this of course was a chemistry teacher. Um, and he was one of the two or three most influential uh, people in my whole career um, because he was one of those teachers that didn't mind when you asked him questions. And he didn't mind if he didn't know the answer. He'd say, oh, I don't know that. Let's do the experiment here and now. Um, sometimes involving large quantities of sodium and water and odd explosions. Um, he was wonderfully and still is called Mr. Badman, Keith Badman, a uh, wonderful, lovely guy. And I recently reconnected with him after about 30 or 40 years. Um, <clears throat> so there I was in Exeter and I decided I wanted to go to the university to do chemistry. <clears throat> I also decided that I really wanted to get away from Devon as much as possible, far away from my parents. And it has to be said, I get on a lot better with my family these days. Now I'm 500 miles away from them. Um, and I decided to go to university in Edinburgh. <clears throat> I might have gone to Aberdeen if I'd known there was a university there, but as it was, I went to Edinburgh. And here's a picture of Edinburgh, and that's uh, where I live now. I've lived in a few other places since then, but that's where I am now. At Edinburgh, I was influenced by another gentleman, a professor called uh, Evelyn Ebsworth. I did a final year project for him, and this was all around the elementary forms of oxygen and hydrogen peroxide. Um, <clears throat> and using hydrogen peroxide to oxidize various main group elements. And that was fun and interesting. <clears throat> and at that point, I had no idea about my career. I was literally the first person in my family to ever go to university. I probably still have more degrees than the rest of my extended family in Devon put together. Um, but I had no idea what a degree in chemistry would translate to in terms of a career. So Professor Ebsworth said to me, Kevin, I think you should do a PhD. Oh, OK, all right, whatever you say. Um, uh, there's, there's a PhD, there's a really interesting one I think you'd like in Cambridge. It's all about oxidation. I went, oh, right, OK. So um, <clears throat> I applied to go to Cambridge. I applied to go to a place called Robinson College. Again, the thought of me going to Cambridge. Um, I was the first person in my family, not just to go to university at Cambridge, but to probably even visit the place. Um, and it has to be said that my experience there was kind of mixed. Um, I had really, really liked Edinburgh. I found Cambridge slightly gray, slightly flat, slightly depressing. Um, but most depressing of all, my PhD was pretty tough. 
we were doing work on something called sodium hypochlorite, which is uh, isoelectronic, the hypochlorite ion with the peroxide ion, um, trying to get some interesting chemistry out of it. This is a, a very widely used raw material used in, in bleach amongst others, um, trying, to, trying to use it to do some interesting chemistry. And what we found, of course, is that the reason sodium hypochlorite is a very good bleach is it's full of different reactive species. Uh, it's impossible, it's really difficult to get clean chemistry out of it. It was during my attempts to get some clean chemistry out of it, um, to do some catalysis reactions, that I did, as has been mentioned once or twice before, blow up a laboratory. In my defense, it wasn't a very big laboratory and it wasn't a terribly big explosion. It was just about half a gram of stuff. Um, I did completely destroy a rotary evaporator. I did blow out the windows. Um, and I, I trashed the bench and, and a few other things and perforated near drum, um, <clears throat> but I survived. Uh, and the scary thing was that was half a gram. I had actually done the preparation uh, a few times earlier on 20 grams, which probably would have been a lot worse. I might have been blown out of one of those windows. Anyway, um, after that, it was decided that an academic career probably wasn't the one for me. <clears throat> so what happened? Well, in those years, a number of major companies, especially those involved in the chemical industry, oil companies, chemical companies, pharmaceutical companies, used to come and visit the universities, called it the milk round. Uh, this was the main recruitment uh, route for graduate staff going into R&D. And I went to talk to BP and they said, oh, we're, uh, we're setting up a really new group R&D center. We're going to spend more than 50% of our time and money on non-oil technologies. We're preparing for when the oil runs out. And this was quite prescient. This is back in the 80s and 90s. Um, <clears throat> and, and it's going to be lots of in interesting opportunities. Uh, trouble was, during the interview, I did have to confess to the fact that I'd blown up a laboratory. And I thought, oh dear, they're never going to hire me. Actually, it seemed to spark their interest. Oh, oh, you blew up a laboratory. Oh, no, that's not a problem. In fact, it's quite interesting because, well, we are blowing up engines. Um, we are blowing up quite large engines. This big green thing here is the giant, there's a human being. This is an engine. This is a giant diesel engine that appears in um, things like container ships. The early 80s, all the oil companies had used uh, Iranian crude oil to manufacture lubricants. In the 1980s, the Iranians had a revolution that stopped and the oil companies there said, no problem, we've got North Sea oil, we'll just distill it and refine it to the same viscosity. We won't have a problem, but there was a problem, um, <clears throat> which was engines exploding, people being sued. And that was the start for me of an interesting uh, four, five, six years working in R&D. So working in R&D for a company is an interesting mixture. You've got some fundamental research going on. We had access to new technologies, new analytical technologies. We were right on the edge of some of these things. The first carbon-13 NMR, phosphorus NMR. Um, so we were doing some pretty fundamental research. We were doing at the other extreme what's called technical service. You're in the lab, you get a phone call from someone who is selling uh, lubricants anywhere around the world, literally, they're a global company. I'm in Singapore, we've run out of hydraulic fluid, we've got some gearbox oil, can we use that instead? Classic thing. Oh, by the way, if you give us the wrong advice, we get sued. Um, which led us into the third kind of work, which was troubleshooting, problem solving, where hmm, we actually are being sued because a customer's engine is blown up and they think it's our fault. So key skills, and these are still the key skills that employers look for now, uh, things like problem solving and curiosity. <clears throat> so we solved the problem. We figured out why it was we couldn't make uh, lubricants out of North Sea oil, and we got a lubricant that could work. Um, then what you have to do is 
launch a new product onto market. Uh, in the same way that drugs and vaccines have to do clinical trials, uh, engine oils go through a whole series of tests. Um, not quite as exciting, but still important. Tests set by engine manufacturers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, tests set by international standards agencies. Um, and then the product has to be, it has to be uh, manufactured. So you need a specification. It has to be launched. And we've got a nice new oil. Well, you need to put it in a nice new package and you hire some people to design the package. And then you figure out how you're gonna market it. So it's very much a, uh, it's very much a team activity. And here, as a chemist, I'm working with engineers, I'm working with mechanics, I'm working with marketing people, I'm working with design people, and I have to share my knowledge. Um, if any of you are interested in uh, more details of that, I wrote a case study, a problem-based learning case study for the Royal Society of Chemistry uh, a few years ago. It's on the Royal Society of Chemistry website. It's called a sticky situation um, and you can download it. It features the adventures of a thinly disguised oil company called Northland Petroleum being sued by a thinly disguised uh, Australian billionaire. <clears throat> so after a number of years, it was decided that I had management potential because I'd been good at fixing people's, uh, people's uh, oil problems. Um, and I was moved into a different job, still involved in the lubricants business, but actually being a uh, salesperson. The, the lubricants business, uh, it's not just engine oils, basically every kind of transport, these are trains, that one's a steam train, and every kind of industry, you know, hydraulic fluid, textiles, the food industry, those are cheeses. Um, this is a cement factory uh, in Egypt. <clears throat> Every kind of industry needs bespoke and specialist lubricating oils. Um, <clears throat> and I was traveling around the, uh, around the globe selling these things. So, yes, I had to know about my, <clears throat> the technical uh, characteristics of the oil I was selling. I had to be very financially aware because I had a budget. I had sales targets um, and a lot of patience, a lot of persistence, a lot of negotiation. But I was, uh, oops, don't want that one just yet. <laughs> um, so the key skills, persistence, willingness to fly a lot. So my job was specifically to sell oils to people in countries where we did not have a BP company on the ground. In Britain, we had BP Oil UK. In France, we had a French company. In Germany, we had a German company. Uh, I was dealing with Egypt and Jordan and the Lebanon and Iran, Iraq and Syria. We did not have companies in those countries. Um, and so I was based in London. I was traveling. I subsequently calculated that I did 95 flights in just over three years on some of the world's least attractive airlines. And the degree of attraction was um, possibly not enhanced by the fact that several of the countries I was traveling to were at war. Uh, Lebanon was in the middle of a civil war and Iran and Iraq were in the midst of what uh, is sometimes called the first Gulf War, Iran against Iraq, old fashioned trench warfare, incredibly bloody um, through the 1980s. Um, so another key skill being polite to people carrying guns, learning a little bit, just a few key phrases in someone's language. If, if all you can say is hello, good morning, and thank you, um, that can get you out of a number of sticky situations. <clears throat> My next job um, was an upwards and slightly sideways move in that we, I wasn't the only salesperson in this group. There were about a dozen of us. And I got promoted to be not just a salesperson, but the technology manager, uh, the person in charge of the science of the sales business. So my job was to keep track on what all of the various salesmen were selling to which customers, making sure they were doing the right things, doing technical support for customers, and also dealing with things like reach regulations, um, shipping, <clears throat> shipping regulations, 
um, material safety data sheets, etc. Broadly, my job was to not get sued, not let us get sued. Key skills here, very different. Um, attention to detail comes up, but also my ability to work with people. Uh, quite a lot of the time I was having to say no to a colleague. No, you can't do that. No, you can't sell those things to those people and explain why that was. <clears throat> <clears throat> my, my final job with the oil company was uh, working back in their technology strategy unit. <clears throat> you remember I'd said that 50% uh, of the oil company's R&D was going on non-oil investments. Um, so we're now about 10, 12 years on into my career, and all the time I've been playing with uh, engine oils, um, my R&D colleagues have been busy working on things like photovoltaics. Um, and new materials, and discussing whether BP should be into pharmaceuticals, it shouldn't. Discussing whether BP should be into electronics and software, it might. Discussing whether BP should be in, into new, um, new materials, uh, aerospace, it did. Um, <clears throat> the issue here is that when you're looking at entering a new business, you don't just need to look at the science, you need to look at the, the money side of things. You need to look at the barriers to entry in that market. And so we write quite a lot of strategies. We think about what the need of the company will be in the future. Um, we need to write reports. We do a lot of analysis. And as a fairly junior person, I'm reporting to very senior people. So I can't tell them what to do, but I need to develop my influencing skills. <clears throat> so early 90s my career changes uh, quite drastically i leave i leave the oil company uh, and this is a shock to many people because the the big the big industries in those days were companies you tended to work for for life i joined ici i'm going to be with ici for my whole career I joined BP, I'm going to be there for my whole career. And that changes in the early 1990s. BP starts to slash out layers of management. We'd had 17 different grade levels, and these were drastically reduced, partly because of the introduction of IT that makes it easier to um, collaborate. The BP research on non-oil projects closes down. Uh, and sadly, some of that's my fault, because I'd written a rather... <laughs> damning post-project appraisal about the effectiveness of uh, us, our activities in that area. <clears throat> the BP lubricants business in Europe, where I've been working, gets effectively sold to other companies. Um, and so I leave voluntarily, voluntarily, which means I took the voluntary redundancy because I knew that although officially I was a fast track manager, <clears throat> I was in the fast track management stream the same way that the M25 on a Friday evening at 5 p.m., the right hand lane is technically the fast track, but it's just jammed. I took my redundancy money, spent a year at London Business School, and this was my first taste of working from home. And there's a picture of me in my bedroom in uh, our little terraced house in Clapham. <clears throat> so I have a mid-career MBA at London Business School. It's great. I have really good experience, really interesting, lots of hard work. Great classmates, I'm still in touch with them, I still network with them. However, um, I come out into the middle of a recession. This is probably my second recession of my career. I've now gone through about five. I write 250 unsuccessful job applications in the, in the next two or three years. But what I did do was I took the advice of um, a recruitment consultant at BP, not at BP, at the business school, sorry. Um, he said, when you're unemployed, there are two things you must do. One is you must keep fit. Uh, it really shows in your body language when you come into the interview. And I covered that because I was cycling from Clapham to Baker Street every day. And if you're not a fit and fast cyclist doing that in London, you're, you're dead. The other thing he said was, don't just look for a job, look for work. There are people with bits of work that need doing who can't afford or don't want to hire you for the whole time. Do little bits of work, build up your experience. So freelance, network, 
Um, <clears throat> so I took his advice. So when London, London Business School phoned me up one day, I'd finished the, the course, but they, they phoned me up. They thought about me and said, Kevin, would you like to go to Slovenia? We have a company out there that we've met. They need some help. They can't afford to pay you, but they'll give you three weeks free board and lodging and we'll pay your airfare. And so I did. I went to this little company in Slovenia, which is ex-Yugoslavia. Um, it's a very beautiful place. It's thoroughly, I thoroughly recommend visit, visiting there. Um, <clears throat> did I know what they, what, they, what they were making? No, they were making all this stuff. This is the controls for uh, what we call HVAC, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. What was their problem? Well, their factory was in Slovenia. Their head office was in Serbia. So it wasn't just a metaphor to say we are at war with our head office. It was kind of um, literally true. I was able to help these people. I did a sort of brain dump on how you set up headqu headquarters function from scratch with the aid of a friend from London Business School. And at the end of that, they asked me, um, do you think we could sell these products in, in Britain? And I said, I have absolutely no idea, but I know how to do it, which is I'm going to make some phone calls. I'm going to find out people in that industry. And I'm going to do a little bit of um, networking with those people and find out what are the requirements for these products. And I actually found a uh, wholesaler of these products in Slough, west of London. And I called them and I said, I've got these boys in uh, these people in Slovenia. You don't know where it is. It's ex-Yugoslavia. Uh, no, there isn't a war on there anymore. It's very peaceful. Um, and they make some equipment in your area. Um, and it looks quite good to me, but I'm not the judge. They said, can you send us pictures? I sent pictures. They said, can you send us samples? So, yes. Uh, I came back, my suitcase weighing about 40 kilos because it was full of great chunks of metal. Um, and over the following year, we negotiated a, an agreement um, and products were exported from Slovenia to Slough and I got paid um, some commission. The company in Slovenia then passed me on to another company that sold herbal medicines and another company that made different types of valve. And I soon developed a little sideline exporting Slovenian products to Great Britain, all the time looking for a proper job. There are people that do this for a living. It's called business development, um, opening up new products in new markets, key skills, curiosity, communication, persistence, and commercial awareness. Um, <clears throat> flexibility, persistence, and also languages. I, I speak no Slovenian. Um, most people in Slovenia speak a lot of languages, but again, it helped enormously the fact that I actually bothered to learn a few phrases. So I could say, hello, good morning, thank you. And I could in particular make telephone calls. Hello, it's Kevin here. Can I speak to Mr. Brankovic? Um, it became a little bit of my party trick. I had some Slovenian phrases that I, uh, I could trot out, much to, much to uh, the amusement, because no foreigners learn Slovenian, they said. Um, of course, the other thing was I had to be aware of the Slovenia was uh, quite peaceful. There was indeed a war going on in the rest of ex-Yugoslavia, um, <clears throat> in Croatia and Serbia and Bosnia, a very tragic, much more bloodthirsty war. You'd occasionally in Ljubljana see people from the other countries coming there. It was, it was like being in, in Switzerland in a way. Um, they all came there to have a chat on mutual ground. <clears throat> Sadly, my Slovenian expertise, I mean, I, after about three years, I realized I was making um, about half my old salary and having fun. Um, but after about three years, it completely stopped because the UK embassy in uh, Ljubljana and the Slovenian embassy in London got together and offered a service pretty much exactly the same as mine, um, but for free. I wasn't charging a lot, but I was charging a little bit. Um, and of course, that work stopped. However, I got a call from another friend, XBP again, so keeping my network going. Kevin, I'm privatizing all the research uh, centers in Romania. I need someone to do some training. Would you like to do some training? You know about taking new technologies to market. Well, I suppose I do a bit. Um, I, I wrote, a, I wrote the, uh, the plan for BP. Um, he said, what I particularly need is, do you have any East European case studies? 
And I said, well, I've just spent three years in Slovenia. I've met three, I've met about a hundred companies. Great, he said, you're what I need. So I spent a couple of years um, doing privatization plans and training. Um, key skills there were know-how and facilitation skills. Um, that became the basis of the work that I still do to this day, training scientists and technologists in employability and commercial skills. Um, <clears throat> the good news was there was no war going on in Romania uh, or the Ukraine, which I also went to. Um, the, what there was, was right across Eastern Europe, lots of people buying very smart and fast cars for the first time and crashing them. That's not actually a crash that I was involved with. I have no idea how they managed to do that inside a multi-story car park. Um, but I was in a situation where my taxi tried to do a U-turn on a motorway and the back wheel fell off. So anyway. I've also done a number of projects in this country and uh, in Europe um, for both directly myself, but also for a number of commercial clients um, and uh, government clients around the world. This piece of work was done for the European Commission, um, and this was this was talking about how I how we might value. Uh, the returns on ammonium nitrate. So these are ammonia plants. Ammonium makes fertilizer. Fertilizer is absolutely crucial to agricultural productivity. Half the nitrogen in your body comes through an ammonia plant. Uh, <clears throat> what we had to do was build a case that the uh, fertilizer manufacturers were putting to the European Union about the returns on their plant and how the prevailing economics of the time, where price had been effectively depressed by uh, uh, material coming out of, uh, out of Russia, where in, uh, agriculture had collapsed, meant that no one was ever going to build uh, an ammonium nitrate plant in Europe again for the next 20 years. And as these plants have a lifetime of 30 or 40 years, um, were coming to the end of their existing life, it probably meant the end of fertilizer production in Europe. Uh, I had to build a case. That's called technical economic appraisal. So yeah, in this study, I'm putting a case to the European Commission about whether ammonia manufacturers should be protected by tariff barriers or not. What's the main bit of science I would have to explain to the commissioners? So any of you who know about ammonia plants might think about that and we'll come to that at the end. If you can do that kind of stuff, Another kind, so the analyzing, analyzing technology and money, another kind of thing you might do is market research. Not market research around consumer products like, should we change the packaging on a Mars bar, but market research on specialist technology companies, and specialist technology propositions. Um, <clears throat> You see this report here. This is written by someone called Select Biosciences. It's all about things called micro RNAs. Uh, doing this kind of work, this is typically for very often for biomedical startups. Um, we have an idea for a new type of, um, uh, of, of scanner. It's going to detect cancers. And then someone needs to go and talk to the potential users of a scanner. What kind of scanner is it? Is it, a, um, is it a, a, an MRI scanner? Is it a PET scanner? What does it do? How good does it need to be? You think it can detect cancer, so you have to go and talk to doctors. How big are these cancers? We're looking perhaps at the secondary tumors from breast cancer. Where are they? Um, how large are they? What's the sensitivity required? Um, are we allowed false positives and false negatives? <clears throat> uh, so the key skills there, curiosity, uh, communication, um, because this is a two-way process. This isn't just asking, reading out questions, commercial awareness and the ability to understand um, and pick up the key, key factors in, in the science. And that kind of work can sometimes then lead on to actually managing the product, uh, the project for the startup company. Um, 
uh, this is called project management. Here we can see the list of all the activities that needed to be done to develop the new scanner I was just mentioning. And you can see there's a huge number of technical activities like building the prototype, um, but also there's a lot of commercial activities going on at absolutely the same time. For example, we need to uh, check that there are no conflicting patents going on um, that would stop us uh, commercializing our solution. And then there's a number of joint activities and you see a lot and lot of lines. And the line means that you cannot, for example, uh, do this project until you've done that project and the lines cross over. Right? Um, <clears throat> you'll hear people talk about Gantt charts and PERT charts. It means they're doing this. And someone needs to have an overview of the whole process and work out how important is any one little stage in the context of the whole project. So, yeah, uh, key skills, problem solving, team working, and absolutely communication. Everyone in the project needs to be given very, very clear instructions about what they need to do, why they need to do it, and when they need to do it by. <clears throat> uh, other kinds of work, I have done policy work. Uh, over the last few years, I was asked to work on a team that was looking at what we call dual use chemicals, dual use chemicals that can be used for both legal and illegal purposes. Um, <clears throat> I was the liaison between uh, two universities, uh, part of the government and various bits of the chemical industry. Um, we were coming up with all this, the universities were coming up with potential technical solutions to some of these, uh, the, to the misuse of some of these uh, compounds and chemicals. And we needed to cross check that with uh, industry trade bodies. Um, I, so my wife got excited. I said, I'm going for a meeting with the CIA. And she said, oh, this, 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 so this must be a very secret project. And I said, no, it's just the Chemical Industries Association. Um, but no, but basically the, the government might ask questions like, if we ban this, who gets affected? And I was the person to some extent answering those questions. So key skills, again, problem solving, team working, communication, as well as being uh, knowledgeable about chemistry. Um, <clears throat> that leads on, if you can do that kind of work and project management, then um, you can also do facilitation work. You can chair meetings for people. You can be asked to resolve different problems. Uh, this was for a university where the various parties, the researchers, the teaching um, staff, the technicians, broadly were facing a problem of overcrowded and overused lab space. Um, they brought all of the interested parties together for the very first time in the same room and realized they needed a referee. Um, I had actually been a rugby referee. Um, this meeting wasn't quite as bloodthirsty, but it was almost as tense. And again, um, key skills coming out, problem solving, team working. Communication is, yes, I, uh, communication not in the sense of me talking a lot, but really, really listening hard. <clears throat> I talked about startup companies a little bit i've alluded to them and that's that's one of the things i've been working in over the the last 15 20 years at least um, universities have commercial offices uh, universities come up with interesting science the science might be commercializable it might be licensed to a large company it might be taken to a new company a spin-out company uh, there are people at each university working in what's called the commercial office, and it's their job to do all this stuff. Um, these are people who typically have a PhD in, in science and usually a some kind of business degree and business experience as well. Um, these uh, over most of my career have been people that uh, have been my clients. Kevin, we've invented this. How can you can you dig around, find any use to it? But I actually was a, a university commercial officer myself um, <clears throat> at the old Roslyn Institute. This is the Roslyn Institute in its original location. 
Um, of course, most famous for um, Dolly the Clone Sheep. Uh, they had a requirement for an interim manager. It was six months. They didn't have a commercial office. They were going to be taken over fully by the University of Edinburgh. They needed someone to step in two days a week for six months um, to be their commercial officer. Um, and again, key skills, commercial awareness, team working, communication, patience, lots and lots of patience. There's lots and lots of paperwork that needs to be done and attention to detail. Um, next thing I've done, actually over the last 20 years or so, I met the gentleman on the right hand side uh, through a mutual contact. He runs a think tank in the city of London. So think tanks are either uh, typically independent, sometimes um, connected to universities and charities, sometimes commercial, um, that think great thoughts. Uh, the gentleman on the right, whose name is Professor Michael Minnelli, runs a commercial think tank in the city of London. Um, and he has used me as his science advisor for a good number of years. Uh, the type of thing that he might say to me, Kevin, I'm having a dinner with lots and lots of very, very important people. Michael is himself astonishingly important. He's currently High Sheriff of the City of London. It's conceivable that he will be uh, Lord Mayor of the City of London at some point, but um, he's a great guy. He said, Kevin, I'm having a dinner. Uh, we want to talk about emerging trends in life science and biotechnology. This is just just a month pre-COVID, amazingly prescient. He said, I need three, um, three young people to be speakers. Have you got any contacts at the, at the, um, in, the bio, in the bioscience world? And so I was able to say to him, yeah, yeah, I, I've, I've trained lots and lots of PhD students. And I was able to recommend one, two, three of them who I was confident could stand up at a meeting of some terrifyingly important people, hold their own, give presentations and participate in the discussions. Um, <clears throat> so that was the fun part of working with the think tank. I guess the important part is stuff around this. Um, ZN has been really looking at the intersection between uh, the green economy and the finance economy. One of the issues is that uh, my old company, BP, um, not very popular with conservationists because it does, it digs oil out of the ground and burn it. Um, not me, but, but the company as a whole definitely did that. Uh, the problem for the UK is that that one company provides something like 10% of all the income of all the pension funds in the UK. So asking BP to just stop doing what making them what makes them money and what makes all their shareholders money is a tricky situation. Um, <clears throat> We started to have discussions. Uh, this gentleman here uh, was still working for BP um, because the city was at that point was saying, everyone's always gonna have to invest in oil companies because they, they, you know, they're, they're very strong balance sheets. Um, <clears throat> someone asked the question, you've got on your balance sheets, all these reserves of oil that you've discovered but haven't dug out of the ground. How valuable are those? And the oil company said, well, they're, they're valued at, at what we know the price of oil to be. Um, I, I, so I think it was probably Michael said, um, yeah, but all that oil you've got, can you actually burn it? And they said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, if, if, you, if you actually burn that oil, what does it do to our CO2? And so I, of course, was the person that did the calculation. And what we quickly discovered was that if all the uh, oil and gas companies did actually uh, sell mm -hmm. and all of the oil in their reserves was burnt, um, we'd be getting catastrophically, unrealistically high uh, CO2 figures. That led to the whole idea of, gosh, well, perhaps the balance sheets of these companies are wrong. Um, you will hear talk, people talk about now um, the idea of stranded assets, which are assets that you can't actually use. Um, that work then led on to another piece of work. 
for the same group of people, we said, well, what's one of the, you know, what's one of the things stopping uh, companies like BP uh, really, really investing heavily in green uh, finance? And it's largely boils down to um, erratic government policies. Green energy is something that requires investment over 10, 20, 30, 40 years. It requires very, very high capital investment up front. It then can generate cash over a long period. Um, <clears throat> and so we came up with the idea of uh, various financial documents and financial uh, entities. Governments borrow money from people. Perhaps they could borrow green money from people to do green projects. Um, and that is possibly the most important piece of work that I've done in my whole career. Um, it's just starting to be picked up on by governments as we come up to COP26. It's taken about 12 years for it to gain uh, a degree of credence. The other thing that I do that I think is possibly equally uh, important, what I do now is I spend a lot of time talking to students, lecturing to students, training students, and broadly what I do is I turn students into successful entrepreneurs. Um, I believe I've trained about two and a half thousand of them, and roughly I have about a one in 150 hit rate of turning students into millionaires. Doesn't sound very good, does it? But actually the chances of a PhD student becoming a professor are rather worse than that. It's about one in 250. Um, I have been therefore freelancing, doing home-based working for the last 25 years. I've done in total about 500 assignments uh, across and around the UK and beyond. I think I have trained about 3,000 people. And there's a little map um, of, of some of my clients. If anyone has any contacts with the University of Aberystwyth, by the way, there's a nice big hole in, in that space there. So where does that leave us? Um, <clears throat> my career, not one I'd necessarily recommend. Um, Certainly working from home for 25 years has its challenges. You, you need a very tolerant wife, uh, for example, or husband or partner. Um, I think what I'm trying to get at here is that every one of those little jobs that I have done can be a full time career for someone. And all those jobs need your science, but they need your science as a starting point. They need a number of the other uh, key skills that I've pointed out as we've gone along to be successful. If you're interested in the rather more formal view of um, careers for researchers, I can recommend this booklet. It's called What Do Research Staff Do Next? It was published by an organization called Vitae, who are all of the researcher developers at um, UK universities. Um, the link is there. You can get it as a free download. And if you can't find it, uh, I have a few spare copies. Um, and so my final slide. It's we're still in lockdown. Um, we're still doing. We're still having a difficult time. Labs may be a little bit uh, fragmented. It may be difficult doing. Um, uh, PhDs and things, what can you do? Um, if you find this interesting, what are your next steps? Okay. Investigate careers. Uh, you could read that booklet, what researchers do next. Is there anything in there that sounds interesting? I'm quite happy to be contacted. Um, I do actually know people in many of those industries. If you're interested in a career, um, go and talk to people. In my last talk, I believe I mentioned something called the Highland Battery Test, which is a series of aptitude tests and um, linked with uh, preference tests. What kind of jobs would you like to do? What kind of jobs would you be good at? So talk to your university careers office. Do you have anything like the Highland Battery Tests? I mentioned something called the Belbin Team Roles Test. 
Um, <clears throat> are you the kind of person in a team situation who loves to lead the team, says shout, come on? Are you the kind of person who likes to be cautious and hang back? Um, look up the Belbin team roles test, figure out what you are. Do a little interview with a friend, a relative, a contact, someone who works in a different job. Um, ask them about their job. What are the things that you need in your job? What are the, what's your industry? What are the challenges that your industry is facing? How's it coping during COVID? That's called an information interview. A uh, perfectly good way to build up your network. You've heard me banging on about uh, teamwork, communication and teamwork all the time. Um, now that's not always easy to do as a student, um, can be very particularly difficult as a PhD student working in a lab. So find some work, find some uh, exercises, some activities that let you build your teamwork. Uh, do voluntary work, join a sports team, run an orchestra. I am a scout leader. Um, scouting is completely about teamworking, both at the, the level of the young people learning to put up tents and at the level of the, the adult leaders. You need to be able to answer the question that will occur at your first job interview. What did you do during the lockdown? And you need to have a, so a good story about what you actually did. Remember what um, the recruitment advisor at London Business School said to me, don't just look for a job, look for bits of work. For those of you that are PhD students, then I very much recommend entering the three minute thesis competition, which is brilliant for your communication skills and the yes competitions that's the young entrepreneur scheme there's one called biotechnology yes there's one called environment yes there's one called engineering yes uh, in which you imagine um, a piece of technology and you write the business plan for your imaginary piece of technology so it's it's practice it's a dragon's den type pitch it's thoroughly good practice for your uh, team working and interpersonal skills. Um, <clears throat> I have a quiz you could organize. It's called a science in the real world quiz. Uh, it's linked below here. Um, why should you do that? Because it helps you understand how your narrow specialism inter interacts with, with the outside world. Um, and finally, um, Working from home, it's tough, um, it's difficult. Do, do, do get outside as much as you can, please, for at least 30 minutes every day. Walk in the morning at the start of day, a walk in the evening at the end of day, um, absolutely essential to your mental health. And now I'm going to finish there.